More bad news for Huawei. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it's uh, everyone's piling on. I guess that's how this goes in these situations, but Microsoft removes Huawei laptop listings from its online store. So apparently Microsoft has now joined in to the parade here, uh, claiming or presumably responding to the executive order, to the government uh, mandate here to, to kind of uh, avoid interacting with Huawei. This is kind of a, an interesting one where they're just the vendor of the product. Uh, of course, it's running their operating system, so they are providing uh, a product as well. Huawei, both their client and them, Huawei's client in a weird way, but... Uh, the MateBook series of laptops, the uh, they've been received really well. They they kind of are MacBook clones, but most that have interacted with them, I actually haven't had one yet, but I've watched a number of reviews and content on these laptops. People really like these things. In, in some cases, the claims have been made that they're some of the best Windows laptops that are out there. Kind of similar to... The reception to Huawei's latest flagships in the smartphone department. There's the MateBook. The, there's the MateBook X Pro that Will is showcasing with a tiny little slim bezel around the outside. So it's like all display. The deck is incredibly MacBook esque, and I can see that being offensive to some users, obviously. Uh, but nonetheless, as you can tell here, Microsoft piling on and getting rid of these laptops. Now, it's not official. It's not a statement. The article that I'm looking at here just says that the listings have vanished, and apparently some individuals have gone to the physical stores, and they're still there. So they're probably going to be selling off pre-existing inventory. But with the listings being taken down, it kind of gives you an indication of the extent of this blacklist and the effect of it. So it's not just smartphones. Laptops are under attack, and this could be the first step in Microsoft doing something similar to what Google has done, but instead with Windows. And of course, this would, in a similar way, cripple the laptop product that Huawei is currently manufacturing. But that's not it, Will. Just today, another story emerges. Huawei can't officially use micro SD cards in its phones going forward. So... The company has been barred from the SD Association. I didn't even know there was one, but there, there's an association kind of like USB and, and various other protocols. And they, 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 they set the standards for these various technologies, in this case, SD, micro SD, and so on. And the SD Association has confirmed to Android Authority that Huawei's removal from the group was due to Trump's executive order making it the latest blow to the besieged Chinese company. So as a result, they can't officially state that they support micro SD and SD. That said, they should continue to work, obviously. It's not like they can turn off a switch, but it's a restriction, and it's another indication of the uphill battle that Huawei has to face living on this technological island where... There, you know, where they there's no allies. It's just them, no SD support, uh, no Windows support, no laptop support, no smartphone support, no Google support. It's unbelievable, man. It is a, a real sticky and tough situation, and it continues to increase in complexity as all of these various organizations, manufacturers, brands, and so on begin to comply with this executive order, you're, you're beginning to see just how far-reaching an order like that actually is. And you gotta, it's, it's just a tough position to be in right now if you're Huawei. What are you supposed to do? <clears throat> you're out here, uh, you're out here, Will. Now you're doing your own OS. Now you're trying to design your own chips because of the ARM situation. Now you're trying to, you can't get displays from Japan. Now you can't, if you want to do an SD card, it can't be officially supported. You can't put the logo on the box and, and, and on the device itself. It's like, 
every single one of these things that piles on, you realize the power in that executive order, as much as officials from Huawei want to want to state that they'll be just fine. And I agree, I think they will be. But in the interim, it, it looks like it can still potentially get more painful before it gets better. It might still get worse before it gets better. Now, I talked about this a little in the past because we, we've been talking a lot about the effect of this executive order and the Huawei ban on the Western side on, uh, from a North American point of view. And I did touch on the subject of China banning American products or the potential to do so in retaliation for this situation. But for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Chinese media landscape, a lot of stuff has been banned already. It was banned before this executive order ever came into play. But most recently, Wikipedia in April, it got the complete ban. So it was available in limited function functionality in certain languages within China for a while. But as of April, it was barred completely in mainland China in every language. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Wikipedia, this, of course, is the place where, I mean, it's like where all information is stored. It's kind of the de facto encyclopedia of the Internet. It is user-generated content, submission-based. There's no, uh, um, the revenue model is based on donations and it's uh, like user and expert contributions that go into it. And it's available, as far as I know, everywhere in the world except for China. Actually, I think there's also a restriction in Turkey because there was something published on Wikipedia that the government of Turkey wanted taken down. And, uh, and Wikipedia refused to do so. Also, it looks like Venezuela is not too happy with Wikipedia. So there's a handful, but you can add China to that list. So it's not just Wikipedia either. Of course, there are plenty of other American-based websites and companies that are blocked as well, including Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and thousands of other domains. Now... To those of you watching from China, or if you happen to be a person that frequently travels to China, you know that it's commonplace to use a VPN while you're there in order to unlock all these various sites and services that you probably want to use. Will's got an even more comprehensive list here, including Tumblr, Snapchat, and a number of other common websites that are definitely going to be blocked, at least officially blocked, without a VPN for locals in China. So once again, I think it's important to cover both sides of the spectrum just to recognize that as much as I've been criticizing uh, this policy here in North America and I've been encouraging the free marketplace idea where competition can be free flowing and take place, the, 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 the pendulum swings in both directions here and it's not necessarily it's not completely rosy on the other end of the spectrum either from a China perspective. So there's a lot of stuff blocked over there. Wikipedia is a tough one because it's a resource. It's a utility. It's used frequently in higher education as a, as a, um, a place to research and, and also cite various sources, get to the bottom of situations. I'm a regular Wikipedia user. In fact, you, you think about an internet without it and it's like, man, I don't even, you want to read on some subject matter. You want to get to the bottom of something. There, It's one of those products. I mean, it's not a product because it's, it's free. It's the free encyclopedia. But it's one of those web utilities that there's not a great substitute for, at least not that I'm aware of. I'm sure there, there, there probably are, but Wikipedia, a valuable resource. Would you agree with that, Will? Yeah, remember uh, Thesaurus? No, not Thesaurus. Uh, Encyclopedia on CD. You're talking about Encarta. Encarta, yeah. Encarta. It was a must-have. In fact, when you got a new PC once upon a time, you had to get Encarta with it. Yeah. Because it was like, you you know, you could say to your parents, "Hey, I need I need this for school. Mm -hmm. I need to have Encarta on there." And prior to Encarta, will 
there were actually physical encyclopedias you would put in your house. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Like full on books. Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm -hmm. And you would have a whole set because they would be stored within books and none of that information could possibly be updated. Not in not when, once it's in your house and you would rarely upgrade or buy a new one because of how expensive they were. But they would publish new versions of it frequently with updated information. I mean, it's an insane concept, but they used to sell these on TV. There would be infomercials oh, right, yeah. for physical encyclopedias. They would say, like, you're, you're doing a terrible job with your family. Get yourself an Encyclopedia Britannica. Every household should have it. And so it gets really weird when you start blocking information sources like this because of how useful they can be and how they can help you understand the universe. I'm sure Wikipedia has its own set of critics for a number of reasons, just like everything does. But I can personally say I've gotten a lot of utility out of Wikipedia, and it's unfortunate that these uh, geopolitical situations can keep it from certain audience members uh, for whatever reason. So anyhow, swings both ways. Now, on the topic of Huawei, you know here, Will, that uh, the, big, the big talk was around 5G. That's how the whole thing kicked off. This idea of uh, the, the improvement and upgrade of our connectivity to the latest standard 5G. But there's a story that came out today about a potential issue with 5G that uh, people on Twitter were asking me to cover, to talk about. And this really actually surprised me. I didn't even, I had no idea about this. 5G could mean less time to flee a deadly hurricane. Heads of NASA and NOAA warned. That's, talk about a headline. Like, who would even draw this connection? Or, it's amazing that I didn't know, or at least that this wasn't uh, more publicized, but I guess this is something that's common knowledge to those that are in the know. It's become increasingly clear that the wireless industry is trying to push the idea of speedy 5G networks. Yes, we know this. Uh, the heads of NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration warn that, the, that 5G could set back the world's weather forecasting abilities by 40 years. So basically the 5G network, the band that it uses, 24 gigahertz, happens to be a very close frequency to the frequencies used by microwave satellites that observe water vapor. And... Essentially what happens is if we're filling up and utilizing this band for wireless communications, it's going to de decrease the amount of data captured by these satellites. So the number here is 77% of the data that's currently being collected uh, for environmental purposes would be, uh, would be lost reducing forecastability by as much as 30%. So, in other words, storms and other natural data, ocean data, and so forth, that can be useful for predicting what the, the future weather and risk factors would, it would just be, it would be impossible to, to uh, obtain it because of our uh, us occupying that band for other purposes. I didn't know that this was a potential issue with 5G. Other people have speculated. I've got a number of emails in my inbox about like health, potential health side effects of 5G. A lot of that from what I can tell is speculative at this point. It's very hard to get to the bottom of that particular subject. I mean, I would love to possibly have an expert sit in this chair right here or maybe two experts arguing either side of it because it seems to be an incredibly complicated subject. But here we have experts from the NOAA and from NASA themselves saying, hey, this is a real thing, and here are the numbers. So I guess people are going to have to weigh out the benefits and drawbacks here. But essentially what they're saying is if you had some major hurricane coming, there's a chance that just because we want faster internet connections here on the mobile that we're not going to know about this hurricane until two or three days later than we otherwise would have. What a, cra what a crazy side effect, unexpected side effect 
of one of our many human advancements. But it always seems that there's some kind of, that nothing comes for free, Will. Like, it's, it, I don't know, man. You push, pull, you give, you take. We talked about it. There's always a sacrifice. It's like there's always something going on. So it's, it's interesting to discover this prior to the full full scale 5G rollout, but an interesting read nonetheless, and I'm sure there's more depth to be uh, investigated. There's there's more to uncover in this particular department. Uh, some Galaxy Fold update here. Best Buy cancels all pre-orders for the Galaxy Fold. Uh, I don't... A lot of people want me to comment on this. It makes sense. I've been Mr. Fold for a while here. Uh, I'm not surprised by this, though, to be quite honest. Like, a lot of this just has to do with the mechanics of how these sales systems work. You just can't have this open-ended pre-order without any information. Nobody, uh, no company wants to be on the hook for delivering something that they're not sure if they're actually going to get. They made a really nice claim, a really nice statement about how Samsung is still working on it and uh, cutting-edge technology like the Galaxy Fold is uh, ambitious and blah 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 the whole the whole thing but alongside saying that they also said okay we're gonna completely cancel pre-orders at this point because we have not received a date from samsung of uh, uh regarding the eventual launch so we just we just don't want to be all tied up in it anymore and i gotta say as much as i'm not surprised what could this possibly be an indication of like why would samsung not be in touch with best buy it's a big vendor you think Best Buy or you think Samsung could be like, okay, like we can give you a rough idea here. Maybe they did give them a rough idea. Maybe Best Buy wasn't happy with that rough idea. Or maybe that rough idea was further along than Best Buy was willing to deal with. It's quite possible. Uh, but either way, those pre-orders are now canceled. And if you are, if you're one of these people that that wants the Galaxy Fold regardless and you believe some of the statements on the improvements, you're definitely gonna need to wait. If it's Best Buy, you want to get it from. In, in all likelihood, your best bet might be Samsung directly at this point because it's going to be tough for vendors to be on the hook considering the issues up until this point. So I would recommend registering. Will's showing the webpage right now. I would recommend pre-registering on Samsung.com. You're probably going to get the best information there as it becomes available. But uh, it's not happening yet, man. It's going to take time. I speculated it was going to take time. It is going to take time. Leading up to a launch like this, the volume of it, you know, the number of units that are going to have to go back to production to get this new screen protector installed that fits under the bezel, it's just, it's just a lot of work. So you're not going to snap your fingers on this. I said it actually way back when I, when I actually physically had the device. You're not going to snap your fingers. It's still going to be a while, no matter what you read on the internet. That's the way I look at it. Uh, Will, oh, Will, you got this story. You got a crazy story. Yeah, it was highly requested. You got a crazy story coming up, highly requested, about this, this deep fakes AI subject matter. Yeah, apparently there's an update on deep fakes. And, you know... When it comes to this, it's just really scary mm -hmm. on how far you can take it. I mean, at this example, it's a YouTube video. Um, it's called Few Shot Adversarial Learning of Realistic Neural Talking Head Models. What a title. So. What? Is that clickbait? What a title. <laughs> Holy moly. And it shows you can literally grab a picture of anything, a painting of like a portrait, and it can actually- Yeah, fast forward this video to showcase what they do with the painting. Yeah, so the the crazy part here, I mean, everybody at this point has seen what the deep fake technology is capable of. But in this case, the difference is they're taking a singular frame, in some cases a painting, not even a photograph, and definitely not video frames. And they're able to, through their learning engine, match- that singular frame with similar yeah, uh, this is similar painting, similar but... images in their data set yeah. to then generate these completely artificial synthesized creatures. <laughs> Here's the Mona Lisa, for example, as a living human thing, hybrid of a painting and then other 
uh, 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 other animated maps from the data set of actual humans. It's really incredible. Uh, there's a there's a ton of detail, in fact, in the video that Will is referencing. There is some kind of Samsung connection. Is that correct? Yeah, they they're working on it in Moscow. I believe. Yeah, so Samsung so uh, I guess this is commissioned some of this work on their behalf. Who knows the eventual implementation for something like this? It's it's actually it's it's hard to figure out like, what is the end game here. A lot of people, when they first spotted this, the tech in its earliest phase, well, we all know what people try to do with it yeah. immediately. And, but then from there, it became like, what about uh, what about weaponizing it? Yeah, like, or propaganda. Propaganda or politics. Like, can you make a person say something and make the world believe that that individual said the thing because that's how good it could possibly get? But if Samsung's working on it, what could there? I mean, do they? You want to put yourself in, dig like, digitized scenarios? Like, why would you need a synthesized version of you? Who knows? Maybe it's not. Maybe this is another one of those situations of the the tech comes before the application. Like that, everyone kind of knows that something interesting is going on here. From a capability standpoint, it's like let's master this and then figure out where to apply it at a later date because it's really amazing technology. And they showcase here as well how much more sophisticated the output gets when you feed it more information. So they showcase the difference between like eight shots, sixteen shots, and thirty-two shots that where, where they can train they can train their uh, artificial synthetic actor or uh, AI subject, if they have more images to begin with, mm -hmm. of course, it becomes more believable. Yeah, and they, they describe how it works here. Um, basically, they uh, have this term called landmarks, which basically tries to find the jawline, the eyebrows, the eyes, the nose, and tries to create like a mask in kind of like a, how Snapchat works. Mm -hmm. it, it creates like a mask. And then it finds those landmarks and creates a face out of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's cool. It's creepy. It's I'm sure people have all kinds of ideas of about like the potential implementation of something like this. But uh, it continues to advance. You can't stop human beings. You can't stop stuff like this. It's pretty wild. Uh, did you know? that the boring company got his first contract in Vegas a 48 million dollar contract so up until this point they'd just sort of been doing some test runs on this uh, underground transportation now they got a real customer in the in the form of Las Vegas they're talking about putting a tunnel a loop a mass transit system to go back and forth to the convention center. They're hoping to launch it in a couple of years at CES. And it's supposed to transport 4,400 passengers per hour at up to 150 miles per hour. That's, I mean, that's a crazy speed, obviously, for a little little transit system. But of course, this uh, this is utilizing some of the advanced technology that you've seen showcased in some of the, uh, some of these, um, some of these drawings, I guess, or, or uh, projections or experiments of like how this transportation could possibly work. There's an image actually as well of how like if this like futuristic train car and what it might look like. Of course, I've been to CES many times and there is an issue moving human beings around Las Vegas. It could really utilize something like this. Uh, the convention center hopes to time the opening of the loop with the 2021 Consumer Electronics Show. So Las Vegas continues to try to push itself as this like tech hub, as the more traditional gambling identity becomes less appealing. Uh, I guess people are, are not as into it as they once were. And so they're diversifying their economy using CES and, and their, their, um, their kind of central... The, them being the central focus of the bigger, biggest electronics show, gadget show in North America, at least. They continue to utilize that to then build out this identity as a, as a tech hub. Here, Will is showcasing a video 
of the speed with which a vehicle could travel in one of these tunnels compared to sitting in gridlock on the surface. It's really amazing tech. It seems super efficient and very cool. Of course, it's got to be delivered. There's going to be Wi-Fi down there, cell phone, intercom, ventilation systems. It'll be, an, it'll be 0.83 miles for about 50 million bucks. So these things are not cheap. That's for sure. But it could be a cool proof of concept to then possibly roll something like this out in other cities and uh, maybe even eventually Elon's complete vision of being in a car and just diving underground when gridlock strikes. What are you laughing about <laughs> over there, Will? What do you got? It's just like when the car made it, the, he's still in the red light. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, but he said, oh, the other dude is still at the same yeah. red light. Yeah. Yeah. Well, his speed was 127 miles <laughs> per hour. I mean, that's incredible. Like, that, that's yeah, way better than insane. freeway speed. It's... It's nuts. I mean, it's obviously better. It's the problem is digging holes. Mm -hmm. Digging holes is hard, man. And cost it costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time, and has the potential to disrupt the surface. Uh, of course, there's in any of these congested cities, there's a lot of stuff going on on the surface. You want to dig a hole under people. I believe there's already two lawsuits in Los Angeles County against the boring company people that are not happy with the idea of tunnels being burrowed underneath there here here it is right here they've been sued the boring company has been sued by at least two neighborhood groups in los angeles they did not want tunnels near their homes so it's it's a lot to, to get something like this going but when you see it in action you kind of start to understand like what the proposal is and why it's cool anyway will you got a couple questions for us today or what uh yep I should let all of you know as well, you've been watching this show for a while now. If you want to get your questions on the show, just got to remind you, all you have to do is email will at lulater.com. It's really that easy. Here's our first one. Hey, massive fan of you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Okay, thank you very much, Connor. What do you think is the next smartphone fad that manufacturers chase after? E.g., who has the highest megapixel camera, biggest screen to body ratio, etc.? The next one, besides folding, folding seems like the obvious choice considering like Motorola is going after it in a different kind of form factor. We've talked about small phones in the past, like maybe a race back to portability could be a possible fad that's being chased after. Uh, screen technology, battery technology, there's a few different ways to slice it. What would be interesting I mean, there's there's kind of what I think will happen or is the most predictable. And then there's also just what I would like. I would love to have Will showcasing these graphene batteries. I would love to have better battery life. Like a lot of people are, might not be old enough to remember original cell phone tech. You could get like a week. I mean, you didn't do anything on your phones <laughs> except they sat on standby most of the time. But you could use a phone or have a phone powered up for like many days, maybe even a week. A smartphone that could do that seems really appealing to me. That would be a cool thing. Of course, up until this point, smartphones that are capable of anything close to that look terrible. Remember that Energizer phone that we showcased here? I mean, it was just, it just didn't seem practical at all. It was a, it was a tank. I don't even know if you're allowed to carry that on an airplane. It's just wild. I mean, the power consumption is still there, and we just, this particular area hasn't advanced at the pace that I think a lot of people had expected or hoped for. So I think that could be a cool, cool place to start from my personal taste. But I think the folding phone thing is, is, has a more of a wow factor to it where people can be asking, like, whoa, what is that? So some kind of a hybrid, some kind of a, device that can really start to replace our more typical traditional gadgets like laptops and tablets and the folding phone is the first transformer type of device that really does aim to solve or put more than put two devices into one put a large display into your pocket and become your your main or only computing device but then again you got the, you got the uh, Motorola concept 
which is much different. They just try to make it even more portable, taking inspiration from the original Razer. So the fad of now is the folding phone. The fad of the future is the phone that you don't charge for a month. That'd be something I'd be interested in. All right, let's take another question. What's your favorite type of technology? Is it phones, computers, headphones, microphones? What are your favorites within that category? I also want to let you know, Will, I appreciate you. You're cool. You only chose this because they put that in there. Yeah. Shout out. Just Good all you, 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 I mean, you just gave them the key to the castle because now everyone's just going to say something nice about I you. I appreciate it. In order to get on the show. And that's too easy, Will. So how dare you? No, I mean, it's cool. I, I appreciate Will also, and I also agree with you. He's cool. Uh, my favorite phone, probably, man, I've been using the iPhone for a while now, but the, honestly, the, the new OnePlus 7 Pro looks promising, though I've got some things I'm going to look into with that because people have been hitting me up with some potential issues with it. I've always been into Pixel phones. I love the cameras on those devices. Wait, so phones are your type of technology? That's no, it's weird the way he phrased it. What are your favorites within that category? Like, oh, is okay. he asking... I okay, my favorite like type phone. of technology in that group of options would probably be phones because they yeah. they do the most and and they have become the the kind of focal point of the technological universe. That's where most innovation is taking place in the groups that he presented there. But I can also p tell you my favorite, like my favorite phones. Uh, my favorite laptop is sitting here right now. It's the X1 Carbon from Lenovo. I've talked about it in the past. My favorite microphone, I haven't talked about this. Uh, this is an Earthworks SV33 and it's, uh, it's actually quite, kind of special and kind of uncommon. So there's that. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, in the oh, headphones, I've talked about this in the past. There's the Sony noise canceling ones that I've been utilizing, uh, which probably have the best noise cancellation of, of any model that I tested. I did a video on Unbox Therapy. I put them again, up against the Bose QC noise canceling headphones, which are kind of like the standard. Everybody's aware of them. And uh, I actually chose the Sonys in a head-to-head -head test. But I'm not the only one to come to this conclusion. In fact, these headphones have been received very well by a number of people. So you can go check out that video if you want. It's titled, The Best Noise Cancelling Headphones, Bose or Sony. They are a bit expensive, though they often go on sale on Amazon. So if you want to check the current price, you can go look at the video that I'm referencing. There's a link there. They have a terrible product name which is the reason I haven't referenced it yet, WH-1000XM3. <laughs> anyway, they're available in silver and black. Will's got the current price right now, $348, and they have Alexa built in. I think they also have Google Assistant if you prefer, but the noise canceling is the wild part. It's tunable. It's, uh, it's magical. So, and, and same with the bass reproduction if you're into that. Um, so I'll, put, I'll take that in the headphone category. So... There you have it. Let's do one more question, Will. Hey, Lou, relating to tech, but in a different kind of aspect, what are your thoughts on the development of hockey sticks from wood to carbon fiber and all these different tapers, kick points that companies are selling nowadays? P.S. What's your current stick? I'm using the Warrior Alpha QX. Cheers from Vancouver. Of course, that question comes from Vancouver. Another hockey player, another Canadian. You know, a couple people sent me this cool uh, video from, I think it was Nasher. He was looking at a stick blade with a, with a bunch of Nasher, N-A-S-H-E-R. And you could put blade because I'm sure it's going to come up right away. And uh, this is a stick that has a perforated blade, holes in the blade, which is a pretty wild futuristic design. I haven't tried it yet, so I can't really comment. But this is an area where things have been relatively the same for a while. So to see something like this is kind of amazing. Of course, it's from a new manufacturer. It's not coming from a like a prestigious or established, not from Bauer or Warrior or some company like this. Uh, my current stick I'm using, I have a, a couple of Bauer Supreme sticks. 
they're not that fancy or special. I also have a um a um a one no sorry a two N. I have a Bauer Supreme. I have a Bauer two N. You know, I'm not super particular on this front. I have some weird taste, though. It's a Nexus 2N. Yeah, I have one of those. Uh, I've also got a true stick as well. I got a few. I got a bunch of sticks, but I'm not super particular on the 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 stick necessarily being the highest end model. No, <laughs> true, true, just true. No stick. True oh. hockey stick. There you go, Will. Right. Will's, uh, he's learning how to Google these days. So which one of these do I have? No, I have the XC9. Here's my thing I am particular about, though. I'm particular about the curve, and I'm also particular about the grip. I do not like a gri grip on the shaft. I prefer a slick, a relatively matte finish on the shaft itself. And... I like a heel curve, a very uncommon type of curve. That's where I would get particular. So, but stick tech, I should probably get into it. I should get the perforated blade and figure it out because there is cool stuff happening. I should order it up. Maybe that's the future. Anyway, we covered a lot. We covered it all from Huawei's issues to hockey stick tech to Will and his weird deep fakes obsession, which we're all aware of. And uh, we'll never really get to the bottom of, to be quite honest. Nope. But that's just Willie Do for you. He'll, no one will ever get to the bottom of what he's up to. It's how he lives his life. It's very intriguing. It's been wonderful being here. You probably noticed the new table. Well, if you're watching, not if you're listening. There's, uh, there's this really... There's, I'm sitting in front of a tree now. It's an, it's an ancient... I don't know how I don't know how old this would be to create something like it's a really it's a wonderful it's a magical piece of furniture it smells good it's uh, it, it's a whole mood it's given me a whole mood and I'm very excited about it and I think I think it's going to uh, inspire me in fact to to keep getting after it well that's what uh, that's what I'm hoping at least maybe not could be a disaster this could be all downhill from here. Mm -hmm. Could go either way, but that's what's fun about it. So thank you very much for joining as usual. And we're going to see you again soon, whether you like it or not.